This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up today, Peter Mathy, President and CEO of Ignite Solar. Next up, Tom Fowler with the Houston Chronicle and FuelFix.com. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to another episode of the Energy Maker Show. Today, we're visiting with Peter Mathy, President and CEO of Ignite Solar. Peter, good to have you here. Good to be here. So tell us about Ignite. So Ignite Solar is a developer. We're located here in Houston, Texas, but we develop projects across the U.S. Uh, we develop large commercial projects, rooftop projects, and also uh, utility-scale ground mount projects. Any projects that you're particularly proud of? Well, we just cr finished uh, building the largest solar project in the Houston area, which, which supports a Pasadena Independent School District. Nice. We're pretty proud of it. It has five different technologies on it. It's basically a learning center for the kids. Uh, it also has a new rooftop tracking system, our own tracking system we designed uh, that we're just launching to the market now. All right, so what, that's one of the five technologies? That's one of the five technologies. We also have the traditional crystalline panels, the blue panels that you see in most installs, mm -hmm. uh, some thin film panels, flexible thin film panels like a unisolar product. Uh, we also have some newer glass-free panels that mount directly onto the roof, good for high wind load areas. Um, and then again, plus our tracking system and an awning. We have an awning in front of the school. So if you drive by the school, you can actually see part of the install. Now people uh, have, with low power prices, there's a lot of concern about solar and its ability to compete uh, with some of the coal-fired power. On projects like that, can you give me some sense of uh, what, what allowed the, the financing and everything to come together? In this particular project, it was uh, funds that came available through, uh, there was a settlement for the Clean Air Act, and they wanted to do something with the money to yeah. offset that, so that, and also a learning center for the, for the kids. So they can really start to learn about the new technologies out there. You know, this is probably the most diverse installation on a school in the U.S., uh, and has some new technology that hasn't been installed other places in Texas at all. So. Well, maybe it'll get the, get the ball rolling. Yeah, and, and as far as the question on cost, you know, the cost of solar has been coming down dramatically. I, I think we're about a third uh, the cost on a solar panel than we were two, three years ago. So, you know, we're still more expensive than a traditional uh, brown power, but I'd say within the next two years, you're going to see that crossover. Now, when you say it's cost effective, does that include government, either federal or state incentives? Uh, yes, it does. I mean, currently there's a, there's a federal investment tax credit incentive um, that until the end of this year is a cash grant payout. That's 1603? Yes. So, so that, that is included in the calculation, and that is set to, to keep going for the next several years. But by the time that ends, I anticipate that it won't be needed again. So, it, but it is there, is. there is some subsidy still available today. And that's federal and then state, same way? That is federal, and then in the in a state, the projects we're working on, we're not actually using any state subsidies. It's just been federal. And do you think U.S. solar uh, panel manufacturers will be able to compete? Is all of that going to Asia? As, as a developer, I'm assuming you're somewhat technology agnostic. We are technology agnostic, uh, and a lot of the technology is going over to Asia. But you're seeing some folks like Unisolar who have a, it's a very nice product. It's a thin film product. It can be applied easily, so there's lots of labor to put it on. Some of the product that's I'd say more technology, technologically advanced um, that can reduce labor in the install, uh, that's innovative. You see those technologies being developed in the U.S., but your traditional technologies are becoming a commodity uh, that's mostly moving overseas. 
So tell me uh, about this rural co-op initiative. So right now we have a uh, initiative where we're, we're going out to the co-ops in Texas and try to bring them uh, renewable power. Uh, and you know, one of the questions you asked for is about cost. And if you look at the curve of solar, uh, the production curve, at the time of day that solar is being produced, which is during your peak, super peak right. time, if you look at the cost of that power this summer as ERCOT started running into shortages, actually solar would have been cheaper during those time frames. So there's a there's a concern uh, where you know there's going to be demand that needs to be met. We need to add to this uh, in their portfolio. So a lot of these co-ops are interested in adding renewables to their portfolio, right. and we're right now we've launched a program where we're going to them and offering them a you know, in one megawatt increments or two megawatt, you know, up to any size they want, you know, the ability to put together a solar project and get it on the ground. Huh. Well, I, I do think that it's an often overlooked uh, uh, piece that when, uh, while wind is certainly blowing in the evenings and generating power, uh, the, the demand for that is less, right? Where it's during the day that, that solar can really add value. And when you're looking at the apples to apples, uh, you need to be sure and look at some of those peak pricings. That, that, that's absolutely correct. And it's actually more uh, attributed to a, you know, a gas-fired peaking plant. So if you look at the cost of a gas-fired peaking plant to solar, solar is actually pretty attractive. Uh, so when you start looking at time of day, the actual power produced, the reliability, you know, solar is pretty reliable. We know with, with a significantly high degree of accuracy when the sun's going to come up, when it's going to set. You know, cloud coverage doesn't tend to change much. You might have one day that's off a little, but generally speaking, uh, it's a very dependable source. Now, as a developer, you certainly have a sense, and we, we talked a little bit about uh, U.S. versus Asia. Can you give me some sense about where we've been over the last year when it comes to solar here in America and where you see us looking in 2012? So the U.S. market has been lagging, um, although it's bigger the market than China is right now. I mean, Ch the U.S. market is predicted to be, I'd say in the next two to three years, the first or second largest market, the largest market has been Germany over time. So even though a lot of the panels are being made overseas in, in China, you know, some in India, some in Europe. Uh, most of the deployment's been in Europe up to date, and now you see the U.S. ramping up. You do What's see, driving that? Well, there, there's it's a state-by-state state, uh, RPS, Renewable Portfolio Standard. Got it. So some states like California want to go to 33% renewables. Yeah. Uh, so most states have a standard that they want to meet to as a percentage of the amount of power they generate. And in some areas, they don't have a specific carve out. It's, it just says to be renewable. And wind doesn't necessarily work well in all, all states. Florida would be one of those states where uh, they don't have a specific carve out um, just for solar. But solar tends to work well where wind doesn't work as good. So it's, it's, it's very regional. And right now, it's really driven state by state. And over the next year, you continue to see that same trend? So. If you look at last year's numbers, we're, we're up 114% in installations in the U.S. This year, we're looking to be about 60% more installations than last year. And we're projecting that to stay pretty much the same, 50, 60% increase year over year for the next five to 10 years. And again, when your company is uh, looking to develop projects, you're looking just at the utility scale solar, not, you know, 500 residential rooftops as part of a subdivision or something. It, that's correct. We, we're we not in the residential market, so we look at the larger projects. We look at, you know, putting a half a megawatt on top of a factory or putting a one megawatt or 10 megawatt on the ground. It, it, just to give an idea of scale of that, a one megawatt facility of about six and a half acres of land covered with solar panels. So, Peter, what, what got you in this business? Well, I, I was watching kind of the way the progression of renewables was in this country. I'd, I'd done a lot of research, um, and I thought solar had kind of gone off that curve already. I really wanted to get into an industry that was just taken off, that's kind of the holy grail of renewables, and that's solar. Right. So, you know, there's no, the sun, the cost of the sun doesn't go up any in 20 years. It's going to cost us the same as it does today, which is, you know, there is no cost. There's no fuel cost. Um, it's a clean technology. There's no noise created from it. Uh, there's no moving parts in the product, uh, and it can deploy easily. So it was, 
kind of the, the perfect energy source. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming by today. Well, thank you for having me. And that concludes our discussion with Peter Matthey. We'll be right back with more right after this. The future is here. You can see it. It's At NRG, we're providing clean energy and now charging stations to make the electric car a reality. Kind of makes you want a boogie woogie, doesn't it? NRG, moving clean energy forward. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome to the Energy Maker Show. We have with us once again Mr. Tom Fowler, reporter for the Houston Chronicle and a contributor to the Chronicle's FuelFix.com. Tom, thanks for coming back. Good to be here, Paul. Now, we're hearing more and more uh, uh, about regulations and fracking. And uh, I heard just recently the Department of Energy, Secretary Chu, convened a panel uh, to discuss fracking. Before we get into what the panel uh, uh, did, t tell us about the convening of the panel. This was, uh, it was done in, I think, May of this year. And essentially it was a sort of a, a, a quick turnaround is what they're expecting to take a look at you know, hydraulic fracturing and seeing what, what could be done in the short term to improve the safety, environmental safety of, of the process. And it was really in response to sort of the growing clamor in the last year or so towards, uh, towards the process and towards gas drilling in general. Obviously, it's been spreading throughout the country, parts of the, parts of the country that haven't seen this level of drilling activity ever, if, you know, if not for decades anyways. So suddenly it's showing up in a lot more backyards and people are, are kind of worried about it. And so there's, it was really in response to that, they said, okay, the EPA has this study that's going on. It's going to take another year or two to, to look at it. But this was a, a short-term, uh, you know, quick look at, at what could be done. And what did they find? Well, it's interesting. They, um, in, in a nutshell, a lot of the, the study said, you know, there needs to be a lot more data, data gathering, uh, a lot more monitoring. Um, but in just from the, the reactions to the study and the reporting on it from you know us and, and everybody else out there kind of shows the complexity of this report and all the different facets um, one of the things that what I came away with it from it was they when it came to hydraulic fracturing itself the actual process of injecting the chemicals in the water into the ground right. to, to, to release the gas they didn't exactly give it a pass but they said that it, it's not the primary issue that it's for the water for the the fracking fluids to actually reach drinking water it's it's, it would take a lot, and it's very difficult for that to see how that happens on a regular basis. They didn't think that that was the, the main issue. They really focused in on air quality issues around drill sites and production. So this was the kind of emissions that come up when, you're, when you've got the fracking fluids coming back up or when you've got produced water from a well, all the emissions that come there. And if it's being captured at the well site, the, um, the emissions from you know, the trucks and the equipment at the drill site as well, and also long term when you have a compressor station, the sort of emissions from there, you, everything from, you know, from output from diesel engines to fugitive emissions from tanks and from uh, you know, methane leaking from, from pipes and so forth. So it was kind of surprising that they came back and said in pre pretty strong language, this is a big issue, this has to be taken care of much, much sooner. And so this is the irony is that environmental community on one side didn't, I think, from in a lot of the grassroots communities, didn't like this idea that they weren't coming down hard on fracking itself. Right. But then the industry doesn't like this idea that, well, you know, they're attacking the emissions part of it because it would then require a whole lot more monitoring and equipment on that end. So it, it's, it's been interesting just how it's, um, they've basically managed to make everybody angry, which usually seems to say you're doing something right if you get everyone mad at you. Now, Tom, who who's on this panel? Well, it's uh, it's kind of an interesting mix. It's not industry, it's not the industry or the government itself, it's um, some of the folks, Dan Jurgen, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author and uh, one co-chairman of uh, IHS SARA, um, John Deutsch, former head of CIA, is also a chemist and MIT professor, and uh, Stephen Holditch uh, is a Texas A&M uh, professor, and a number of other folks, as well as uh, Fred Krupp with the Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, so it was, in some senses, uh, you know, it seemed like a balanced group to a lot of us, uh, environmental 
community didn't like it. Too many of these folks they thought had uh, industry ties. Deutsch is on the board of Chenier, for instance. Um, and then others, but then American Petroleum Institute says, you know, there's no, in, there's no industry folks on here, nobody who actually goes out and fracks wells or anything like that. So they didn't like the, the makeup of the board either. And, the, and their findings serve what end? Is, well, is it to sway EPA to some different way of thinking? Because they're, they're acting outside of DOE's uh, responsibility, right? Yeah, it definitely isn't something that DOE normally looks at. It really, it was, you know, Secretary Xu, Xu called this at the request of the president, and the idea is that, okay, if how will, you know, th that the administration will take this under advisement now. Will they, um, will they then encourage the EPA to, to go push in these areas like the emissions? Will they, um, will, the, will EPA also conclude similarly that the uh, the fracking issue isn't necessarily there. I mean, the, the study the EPA is doing is going on on its own, on its own. It's very independent right. from this as well. But it really, it's, I guess the idea of it is it, how will the administration, how will the White House take this information and, and guide further policy? Um, and so that's kind of what we're waiting on next is to see. There's still another draft of the, uh, the final draft of the report to come through, but really what's Department of Energy and White House going to push forward with those recommendations? Any predictions? Um, Hard to say. I mean, especially with the presidential campaigns heating up, and right. you know, one of the uh, and certainly with the budget discussions, um, the, the super committees being formed with uh, with sort of the coalition of uh, of uh, Republicans and Democrats have to now decide on a lot of the cuts. One of the things we're hearing is you know there's going to be a big push to defund the EPA, which is very far out there. But um, anything that sort of reinforces that arm that the regulatory arm seems like that that'd be a it's going to be a hard battle no matter what given the environment that we're in right now as you look ahead over the next say six months within the world of natural gas and fracking what do you view as some of the stories to come well certainly what's going on on the regulatory front if uh, EPA just a couple of uh, uh, in recent months came up with some new some proposed rules around emissions at the wellhead um, and if they move forward with that that would have a lot of impact on how companies actually operate out in the field what type of rules are they thinking it, it's it's more capturing emissions monitoring emissions a lot more okay. than they have um, another thing that's been interesting is that in response to all of this, uh, the the uproar about from the from communities, a lot of companies have been trying to be more proactive um, with developing new technologies. Um, you know, Shell, for instance, a couple weeks ago or months ago, now came out with uh, sort of these uh, best practices that that they're going to be following in the field for you know recycling water for. Um, reducing the footprint of their uh, operations. I know uh, Devon Energy has been given a lot of credit for in the Barnett Shale around Fort Worth for uh, for doing the for several years now doing that a lot better. Uh, Halliburton even I think has come up with some technology that does better with recycling the water or, or replacing components of the frac fluids that are more toxic with other other things. Colleagues of mine are, are writing these these stories right now and have them coming out. So there's a the industry is. It, while a lot of times it seems like they're being they're a little tone deaf to these complaints, there's a lot of st some companies have been reacting and have been trying to do a better job and seem to be moving in that direction in any case. Well, Tom, it is always a pleasure to sit down. I hope you'll come back. Sure enough, I will. Perfect. Well, that wraps this week's episode of the Energy Makers, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson, and we'll see you next week.